run it on QI a few years ago. Yeah. There's no such thing as a fish. Yeah, there's no such thing as a fish. No, seriously, it's in the Oxford Dictionary of Underwater Life. It says it right there, first paragraph, no such thing as a fish. Hello! And welcome to a very special edition of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast this week coming to you from four undisclosed locations in the UK. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with Anna Tushinsky, Hi. Andrew Hunter Murray, Hello. and James Harkin. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones, but not with four facts this time. No, this time we are here with 35 facts for this very special comic relief show that we are going to be doing. 35 facts, each lasting 35 minutes each, presented by 35 different celebrity guests, all in aid of 35 years of comic relief. That is right, and we don't have a shred of regret about the (laughs) trial that we've committed ourselves to. We couldn't be more excited. We hope you guys are really excited and really want to emphasise that hopefully we're going to have a good time along the way. Some laughs, maybe, some gags, but the point is this is about a really serious thing, which is that we want to raise as much money as humanly possible. Comic Relief is such an amazing, amazing charity. It's needed so much more this year even than it has been before. So COVID has destroyed lives here in the UK and around the world. Comic Relief donates money pretty much half and half, UK and globally, to try and lift people out of poverty, to try and provide them with the basic essentials needed for a, you know, to lead a vaguely decent life. So even if you give a little bit, like five pounds, five pounds will give a toiletry pack to someone who's sleeping rough. Uh, If you can spend a little bit more, you could pay 50 pounds, for instance. That would help to pay for two weeks of intensive therapy for a young disabled person in Malawi. So whatever you give, it will be so, so useful and so desperately needed. That's right. And there are lots and lots. I'm going to take this off. (laughs) <laughs> I yeah, say, the voice is a bit weird. These things are very, very comfortable and you should definitely buy them. But we'll get to that in a second. But there are loads and loads of ways that you can donate to Comet Relief. Uh, one way is to go to cometrelief.com slash fish. And that will take you to our Just Giving page uh, where you can give as much or as little as you want. Just whatever you can afford would be amazing. Uh, but the other way is to go to cometrelief.com and they have a shop there and you can buy things like these amazing red noses, which have no plastic in them this they year. For the no first plastic time whatsoever. Really. It's very exciting. I, is it sugarcane derivatives? Either way, yes. it's really, they're so comfortable. They're very easy on the nose. Um, they're lovely. And there are nine, I think, different um, species and varieties that you can get. And each one comes with a little box and you can make a little house for it by turning the box inside out it's really nice uh, <laughs> i was reading the other i was reading today about how much money youtubers make by doing unboxing things oh, you yeah. know where they buy a buy a gift or something and then they <laughs> open it up so i have one of these here a red nose thing hmm. and i'm going to open it for the first time and let's see what i get oh my goodness <laughs> this could make me millions on youtube it's Oh, it's the same one as the other one. Well, there are, <laughs> there are nine different ones that you can get. Uh, Andy, you're rocking one of the T-shirts that you can buy. Yes, you can get. Hang on. I'll just uh, raise we myself. Sh- into we position. should say very quickly, uh, getting messages that we're lagging at the moment with the video. Don't worry, everyone. We will fix it. We will get it better. So we are moving robotic. Apparently, our audio is all very good. But um, <laughs> uh, as someone, someone's saying, oh, my God, I can finally put faces to the voices. Yes. Welcome to our faces, everyone. Welcome <laughs> to the faces of No Such Thing as a Fish. What you don't know is that in, in real life, we do lag. So if you ever yeah. see us in the street, we're always a few <laughs> seconds behind our voices. Yeah, um, we're very jerky. I think that's why people call us jerks a lot. <laughs> that's, yeah. No one's uh, used Anna, that word the 90s, I know it. What are you rocking on your head there? Oh, this, this little guy, are you talking to me? <laughs> yes. Sexy hairband, yeah, also available at the Comic Relief website. Love them. I'd forgotten how flattering a good hairband is. I haven't worn them, haven't worn them since I was a kid. Um, if you only have one pound to spend, you can buy a little kind of pin badge. Very nice. Oh, so cute. <laughs> um, but, yeah, if you want to donate, then the best thing really to do is to go to comicrelief.com slash fish, and you'll get to our Just Giving page, and you'll get us closer to our target which we don't know what it is, but we're going to try and get as high as we possibly can. What is it going to be, £100 billion? Pounds, that's right. That's right yeah. yeah, well, that's the idea, is that I, my personal ambition, I, I'm thinking a million minimum, 
Um, <laughs> Wow. But we, we have set the target a bit lower at 35,000. I do want us to smash that. I want us to absolutely smash that. So if you are watching right now and you can help us out, we would really appreciate that. Um, we are going to sort out this lagging, so so don't worry, everyone. Um, and maybe very quickly, we can give you a rundown of all the interesting guests uh, that we've got coming on to the show. Because, I mean, wow, we this is going to be an amazing <laughs> 20 hours. So, um, you know, you're going to see later on in the show, we're going to see Stephen Fry and Sandy Toxvig and Dr. Maggie Adderin Pocock. You're going to see Mary Roach, who's over in the States, Tim Minchin, who's down in Australia, Neil Gaiman, who's in New Zealand. We're going to be the UK guests like Armando Anucci. We've got Sally Phillips and Ronnie Ancona coming on together. My dad wrote a porno. All three members are going to be here for the first time in a sort of a smash of the porno fish brigade i don't know how to <laughs> and um and so what we'll do is we're gonna take a very quick break to get ready and we'll be back with michael palin uh in just a few minutes <laughs> gentlemen, welcome finally to the opening fact of No Such Thing as a Fish, the comic release special. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving us money if you already had. We've got 20 hours ahead of us and we have the most exciting first guest to kick it off. Ladies and gentlemen, giving us fact number one of 35, it is the almighty Sir Michael Palin. <laughs> I can't, the introduction was too much. <laughs> got to have a glass of water. Um, my fact is, in the 1920s and 30s, there were many desperate attempts to climb Everest. Uh, few more bizarre than Morris Wilson, whose idea was to fly a plane from Purley to Tibet, crash land it halfway up Everest, and walk the rest of the way to the top. Wow. By the guy. Good idea. Yeah. And did he make it? <laughs> No, I, oh. I checked the story again, and I found out that, I mean, Maurice Wilson was one of these terrific sort of gung-ho, jolly um, aviators who was also, they were also aviator, mountaineer, and mystic. I always think when you see mystic there, you know that means <laughs> basically <laughs> loony. Um, mm. And he, he took off from Purley, and uh, the, I think it was a um, gypsy moth plane, it had a limited range, about 600 miles, so he had to keep stopping almost every large town on the way to <laughs> Tibet. And he totally ran out of fuel by the time he got to India, so he parked it somewhere in northern India and disguised as a Buddhist priest, um, a Buddhist monk, sorry, he, he entered Tibet with one pony and three guides and tried to um, climb Everest from that point on. To be wow. fair to him, to have got from Purley all the way to Tibet as someone who basically just taught himself <laughs> to fly and then bought a second-hand beaten-up old plane, I think that's pretty impressive. I'd give that's, him a silver medal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I well, I think so too. I mean, it's it's you've got to be fairly, um, ha, ha, what's the word? You've got to be fairly mystical to believe that sort of thing <laughs> is going to work. Yeah. Um, and I think he just had a total self-belief, as did a lot of explorers at that time. There was a wonderful man called Young Husband who. Um, Sir Francis Young Husband, who they, they operated on, on that area of the Himalaya, um, I think called the Great Game, which was between sort of Russia and the British Empire. And they had spies out making sure that the Russians didn't come south, and the Russians had spies out so making sure that they didn't go north. And Sir Francis Young Husband um, was the sort of fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, also a bit of a mystic, believed in, in free sex and eugenics. And he, he invaded Tibet on his own without asking, <laughs> without asking the British government. In 1904, he, he, wow. he went over the mountains and invaded Tibet, and he was severely ticked off when they find out what he'd done without asking. So there you go. Wow. I love, I think, I've noticed, Michael, that, I mean, you, you are an, an adventurer. You've been to so many places. I've never found a book that is called How to Be an Explorer. And my theory behind that is that all the things that all the great explorers did, are you can't put them in a book to recommend because they were so wacky and their methods were so bizarre that if you probably used them, you would die in the process. And and it's, you know, there was a great um, explorer called Sebastian Snow. I don't know if you've ever experienced him. 
but um, he used to travel the Amazon. He was the first person to walk all of it. Oh, yeah. And mm. he, um, he never learned the local language. He never carried any weapons on yeah. him because he was so accident prone. His friends thought he might accidentally shoot himself if he did. Mm -hmm. um, so he got by uh, drinking puddle water. He never brought any water. Somehow this guy survived. And his motto was, bash on regardless. Oh, that, you know, well, that's, um, that, is, that is quite eloquent for an explorer because a lot of them just barely barely said anything. They just kept going. I mean, Colonel Fawcett is the great one for the Amazon. Mm. You'll know about him. He believed that the lost world, lost kingdom of El Dorado was in the middle of the, the Amazon jungle. And and he just thought he'd go to the Amazon jungle and, and ask, you know, excuse me, see El Dorado? Yes, over there, mate, over there. <laughs> and eventually, I think he, it, it was said that he disappeared. He was lost, believed, eaten somewhere in the middle oh, of the Amazon yeah. jungle. But I think that's most unfair to the tribes because I don't think they would have eaten force it. I think it sound well, taste. He could have been eaten by an animal, I guess. But I just think lost, presumed eaten is a hell of a way to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a, of course nowadays. I suppose you'd know what had happened to him, wouldn't you? He'd be all he'd be on have a little sort of chip on him and all that, and he'd know yeah. exactly where he yeah. was. He that's the great thing it. about. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he would have been. Yes. <laughs> Just about to be eaten. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Legs what, gone. What sort that's of sauce should I eat? <laughs> have it with? Yeah. Um, but that's the thing with Morris Wilson is we're not sure whether he got to the top or not, are we? Because there was um, a um, man called Thomas Noy who apparently found a tent um, that he thinks might have belonged to him, and it was very, very high up Everest. And he thinks if it was his, then it could be the highest that ever anyone's got up there. So, well, wow. that's interesting because the. Um, uh, this was, uh, I think it was in the 1930s, wasn't it? Mm. It was after Mallory and Irvin had made their uh, third attempt to climb Everest in 1924. And they were, they were seen on the last stage disappearing into the clouds within a, you know, thousand feet of the top of Everest or less and were never, were never seen again. So that's an extraordinary story because no one really knows to this day whether they actually got there or not. And Mallory's body was found about three, I think about sort of three years ago or something like that. Do you yeah. know the story, yeah. Michael, about with Mallory, there was a suggestion that when he got to the top of Everest, he was going to leave a photo with his wife. So he took a photo of his wife in his wallet. And as soon as he got up there, that was going to be part of his ritual to say, I did it, leave it there, I brought you with me. So we obviously don't know if he made it or not, but when they found his body, and there's an amazing bit of footage that you can see yeah. where... It's extraordinary. And they find all his things and, and his name, Mallory, there it is on his tag. He's fully preserved in the snow. Well, well, but in, did he have in, a, sorry, did he have a, he had a name tag? Yeah. It, was on, it was on his underpants, wasn't it? He always just, had his name. In the, well, he was a public very, school boy, you know. He always had, a, <laughs> <laughs> had labels on everything. But when they, when they went through his wallet, they found his wallet. They found, they didn't find the camera. But one thing they didn't find in the wallet was the photo of his wife. Oh. Wow. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that Andrew Irvin, who climbed with him, was one of the, the two who went up. Irvin had had an affair with Mallory's wife. Really? Ooh, did you know that? No. no. Yeah, so maybe yeah. maybe he stole the photo from the wallet. Yes. Because he <laughs> fancied the wife so much, and then That's everyone it. thinks that Mallory made it. You want that? Yeah. <laughs> it, there you are, you see. The, this, these That's things. The twist. It, all, it all came down to sex. That's all I know. <laughs> well, it did. With Morris Wilson, there seemed to be some sex involved. Apparently, the only person who had any faith in him was this woman, Enid, I think, the sort of love of his life, who was over in the UK. And he, Morris wrote the, these diaries and these letters to her. And it's the kind of thing I always find amazing, like Scott in the Antarctic. How do they write letters? So Wilson was sort of up in this tent at um, base three, I think, you know, yeah. freezing. He's about to die. And he still has the wherewithal to get his pen out and... Um, I think the last mm. entry he wrote was when uh, he was writing to Enid. He'd left the two Sherpa companions, Tawang and Rinting, yeah. who'd been Ooh. very loyal to him because yeah. they didn't really believe, you know, he was mad. He'd never climbed before. They were having to tell him how to do Yeah, exactly. Off. I don't think he'd ever flown before. He was a, no. one of those people who tried, <laughs> yeah. try, you know, beginner's luck man, yeah. Yeah, and it got, got him a long way. And his very last entry in his diary was ended with the words, off again, gorgeous day. Oh, just nice. Oh. And that's very British, isn't it? The weather. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> oh, climbing Everest, a bit drizzly. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. But I, I, I read. A, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go on. No, no, go on. No. Well, just I was reading a bit more about his journey there. 
I think mm. once he got there, he was interviewed by the Daily Express. He was interviewed in when he was in <laughs> India, and he said, "Oh, I got, by the way, I'm just off to climb Everest." And um, but the British authorities have banned him, so that hence the disguise that you mentioned, Michael. Um, but he had to hide all his climbing equipment and bags of wheat. Um, <laughs> really he and great. his guides were just carrying <laughs> oh, just some guys yeah. carrying some bags of wheat, full of all the crampons and everything you needed. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. I mean. Uh, Disguise was a big thing up there at that time. I mean, these sort of people who helped young husband and the British Army were working up there, and they were called pundits, and they were very, very um, bright young Indians who understood uh, about uh, maps and, and um, tracks and knew the paths absolutely perfectly. And they were sort of sent into Russian territory in disguise. They're all they're all disguised. I think mainly monks and things like that, but woodchoppers and you know, sort of uh, probably some of them in drag. I don't know. It was, <laughs> it was very much a place where that, at that time you could go off and do strange and weird and wonderful things, mm. and you were so far away from the centre of command that you could very often get away with it. So I presume that was something in. Uh, Maurice Wilson's makeup. He just yeah. felt that, you know, he could go off and do these things and be the first to get uh, to the top of Everest by the most ridiculous mean. Yes, yeah. <laughs> is, is there anything, but is there any link between the pundits that you just mentioned, Michael, and pundits, as in yeah. sports pundits? That's where we get the as name. In, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. Well, so did those pundits stand at the side passing comments and saying, <laughs> oh, he's oh really it's a mountain of two halves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think, I think they were supposed to, got pundits, they, they knew the answer to so much. They, mm. they helped these oh. explorers. So it was, it was considered they were experts. No one quite understood why, but they were experts. So I think it's the expert bit, um, mm. if you can call them. Cricket pundits experts. It's, <laughs> it's interesting how the word, word it's one of those words like bungalow that came out of India and all that and around that time. Speaking of um, words, I was reading about the first woman, uh, first European woman, I should say, to climb up Everest. Uh, yeah. And this was uh, a woman called um, Rukkaevich. Uh, she was from uh, Wanda Rukkaevich. She was from Poland. Uh, and she was from a family who were actually from a Lithuanian town called Plunge. Oh, <laughs> yeah, not good on your CV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but she actually got to the top of Everest on the same day as John Paul II became the Pope. So oh, so a day for Poland. Sorry, comma became the Pope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, but it was an amazing day for Poland, and those two people re uh, met up later, and the Pope said, "The good Lord wanted us to rise so high on the same day," and Isn't he that, thought that, yeah, yeah. There, there, you know, you know, you've heard about the Pope doing all that, but I never heard that story about her. She yeah. obviously it's a woman again. It's a woman thing. She wasn't <laughs> given the um, given given the opportunity. But uh, I mean, uh, I think that what's interesting about Everest was that people didn't really start to try and climb Everest until after the First World War. Mm -hmm. Mallory and Irving were thought to be motivated by the fact that they'd lost so many of their the young men, people of their age in the war. And yet they were still alive. So it was a kind of guilt thing. We've got to do something to show that you know, there can be better times for the country. But mm -hmm. another, one other thing which I've found in my travels is, is that you, you would think, well, the Sherpas, people who lived in Nepal, would have nipped up there in the 14th century or whatever, you know, they'd been up there. But actually the people who live in the area very rarely want to climb the mountains. I remember talking to a Maasai who were looking out over Kilimanjaro. And I said, you must... You must go up there all the time. You must just be able to just nip up and look down and say, go on, hey, you must be, you must be mad. <laughs> yeah. so, why? Yeah. Well, he it, said it's cold. It's, <laughs> it's, it's very miserable. Why would we want to go up there? There's nothing growing up there. Yeah. They're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Thing, but you never go to the tourist sites of the place you live in. You know, I've never been to Madame Tussauds. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're talking yeah. about climbing Madame Tussauds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, Madame Tussauds is just stuffed with Maasai warriors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, love, I read such an odd thing that I, I never knew. So uh, when Hillary finally did manage to do it and came down, the first person that he saw and our first sort of words from the, the conqueror of Everest along with Tenzing was, well, George, we knocked the bastard off. And that was in uh, that was a sentence delivered to a guy called George Lowe, who was his climbing partner, also a New Zealander, the only other New Zealander. Yeah. There. And so I, I knew that story, and I knew that the sentence was directed at George. What I didn't know was that there was a keepsake from the top of Everest that 
mm-hmm. uh, that Hillary brought down to give to George Lowe, which was a fragment of marine limestone, um, collected yeah. limestone at the top yeah. of Everest. Yeah. Hey. That, is a, that is an amazing, the most in Malayas, I think, sort of a southern um, African plate collided with a Eurasian plate in the mountains where they, where they hit. The mountains were sort of forced up. And yes, Everest, top of Everest is on the seabed. So there are actually, there are, are fossils of seashells on the very top of Everest. And there's the, the top, the peak of Everest is made of limestone mm-hmm. uh, from thrust Lovely. five miles up into the air. Always, again, I always find it amazing that they manage on these expeditions to remember to collect the, you know, ge- geological rocks, basically, that they've been told to, <laughs> when yeah. you're, again, about facing life and death situations. Oh, yeah. Barry told me to get this pebble. Yeah. Oh, I'd rather go for that. <laughs> but, but you see, that would, be, that would be, nowadays, so many people go up there, that Everest would be several yards shorter. <laughs> yes. so people taking a bit back. Oh, I'll bump a bit. I'm not going to send a bit. Uh, Michael, um, you've walked around the Himalayas, haven't you, um, extensively, right? Was yeah. Was it dangerous or was it, you know? Um, well, um, we didn't get into great danger because we had to produce a television series. So, you know, the next yeah. day you had to be back at work to do something else. <laughs> but, I mean, um, it was pretty tough up the um, Everest uh, mm-hmm. section. I mean, we, we, only, we went to about 17,000 feet and we could walk there with a yak. Train, didn't have to have sort of oxygen or anything like that, but it was it was bitterly cold, and we were at the best time of year. And I can see just as you got further and further up how dangerous it, it would be, and and also you had to go with people who knew exactly where you should put your foot next. It was literally like that: mm-hmm. just take one step to the side, and you'll be you'll be sort of down, or you'll, you'll break your ankle or something like that. So yeah, you had to be very careful, but. I never felt it was utterly dangerous, but I could see for those who went to the very, very top um, were you know, risking their lives, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, I went to, um, sorry, go on, Anne. I was just going to say that you said you mentioned that it will be shorter now, Everest, but actually it's taller, turns it is. out. It now, is. Why, why is that? Um, well, I think it's, it was a big dispute, wasn't it, between uh, China and Nepal uh, yeah. over how tall it was, and yes. they thought might have got taller because of the earthquake in 2015 which again as you said shifted some tectonic plates around Mm. and um also maybe related to global warming thinning snow caps and stuff so they thought let's measure it again china and nepal having this big diplomatic argument anyway over how tall it was so it was quite a nice diplomatic story uh 2019 i think nepal nepalese people went up 2020 chinese people did and then they made a joint statement saying it's now 8,848.86 meters so it's gained a little right. bit. Yeah. Nice. yeah. I, I suppose it's easy now. Is it easy now to tell how, how tall a mountain is? I mean, you can do it from, so you can do it on Google probably or something like that. You, know? <laughs> yeah. 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 you don't actually have to go up there with a tape measure. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's that great story, and I don't know if we've ever verified it. And I'd love, so if someone watching this knows the answer to this, yeah, please right, let us yeah. know. There is the story that when it was originally measured, the, the mathematician who measured it measured it at 29,000 feet. Exactly. Good and he was so worried that no one would believe him because it was such a round number that he added yeah. two feet, 29,002 feet, just out of fear that <laughs> no one would believe his calculation. <laughs> well, that's very good. A blow against precision. I like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's another interesting fact I found about Everest was that Sir George Everest, it's named after Sir George Everest, the geographer, and he, he pronounced his name Everest. <laughs> and apparently mm-hmm. he was very irritated when people say, oh, we've been up your mountain, George. They call it after you. So Mount Everest. E- Everest. Everest. Oh, Jack, please. Everest. I mean, it just doesn't sound anything like a mountain, does it? Everest. Everest. It sounds like it's a massage parlor in yeah. southern India. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think he ever saw the mountain even. I, I mean, he definitely didn't climb it. We know that, obviously. But no, he, he yeah. went up to the foothills of the Himalayas because he was the he, he spent twenty five years doing the Great Trigonometrical Survey of India. That was yeah. the huge, you know, abiding passion of yeah. his life. He was the Surveyor General. But I think in later life he was slightly embarrassed that this had been named after him because it wasn't really very much to do with him. Yes. Um, well, well. I, I mean, I prefer. I think it's just that the the local name is Chomolongma. Mm. Yeah. I think that's what it is. The the Tibetan name which sounds much better somehow. Yeah, yeah um, it really does. But then 
it's this naming thing. A lot of the mountains were sort of, well, actually, I'm not sure about the Himalayas, but certainly when I was writing a book, book about Antarctica, um, the expedition that went there in, in um, 1842, um, because they had to name all these various places that no one had seen before, capes, bays, mountains. And he just went through his sort of um, his address book and named them after people he, he, he knew and uh, people he owed a favour to and all that. Uh, right. So it's interesting. That's so funny. <laughs> It's a good reason to befriend an explorer. You know, get some adventures in your phone book. You might have a mountain named after you. What would you most like to have named after you? Do you think? Oh, oh gosh, that's a good question, isn't it? All the good stuff's sort of been done now, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think a, sw- a swimming pool in Bolton, maybe. Yeah. Just like a, <laughs> yeah. a swimming pool in Bolton. Yes. 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 <laughs> so, I, I actually went to Nepal, and um, I was I kind of thought I might go to the to the bottom of um, Everest, but. I just didn't have the energy or the time or the inclination or anything, but they drove me <laughs> up and they, they let me take a photo of it, um, which was mm. really cool. Uh, but one thing I thought about being in uh, Kathmandu, which you might, I don't know if you remember this, Michael, yeah. which is that there's lots of kind of street children around there, a lot of working children. And actually, this is something that Comet Relief uh, has helped with quite a lot over the last few years. And in, since 2003, they've given more than £10 million um, to help children in the yeah. fall. And I got to say, one thing that I found really funny is I was on the street uh, and this kid came up to me and he said, "Uh, where are you from? Where are you from? And I said, I'm from London. And he said, uh, I said, I'm from England. He said, "Uh, England, capital city, London, population 67 million. I was like, wow, that's amazing. (laughs) I said, said, do you know all of those? And he said, yes, I know every capital in the world. Mm. And I said, well, I know every capital in the world as well. And so we had a big capital city off in the middle of the street in Kathmandu. (laughs) And um, yeah. I, he said, um, I said, okay, what's the capital of Canada? And he told me, and then he asked me, what's the capital of France? And so I thought, I'll give him a slightly more difficult one. What's the capital of Belgium? And then he came back to me, like, what's the capital of Madagascar or something? He started asking me all the really, really, really yeah. difficult ones. Yeah. And then I just thought, I'm going to have to get out of here. So <laughs> gave him some candy and got out yeah, of here. <laughs> FYI, that's the rest of this show, everyone. <laughs> yes, a, get him on, get him on. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I knew I once was in Ethiopia and I met a child in the street and I was going on about um, my love of football, you know, and I'm mm. from, from um, a city that play football and all that. Do you do you know football? Do you play football? He said, he said yes, well, what, what, what's your team? And I said, well, oh, well all right, it's uh, Sheffield United. And he said, oh, yeah, they lost on Saturday. <laughs> Put me in my place. <laughs> but to be fair, that could have been any Saturday. Yeah. Be my <laughs> Don't be nasty. Oh, calm <laughs> down, down, guys. Yeah, I shall go and get one of my books. <laughs> Is that you? Um, uh, I we, mean, uh, there's one... Gonna, sorry, you go, Michael. No, I was just going to say one very quick comic relief story that I had. But again, in Ethiopia, we went down the south and we got to a small village and... Um, uh, comic Relief had put some money into digging a well, uh, enabling the people in the village to dig the well. Um, and it made a huge difference to village life because the women had had to go for four miles to the nearest place to get water and bring it back on their heads and all that. And, and it was always the women who went. So it caused terrible ructions because the men were really fed up because the women were always at home now, you know, because <laughs> the well was working there. All you had to do was press a pump, thanks to comic relief. These poor men lives were made of misery. <laughs> <laughs> well, they like they stop you giving any money to comic relief, by the yeah, way. Yeah, no. And by the way, if anyone's watching this, you can donate via our Just Giving page. That's the whole point of this thing today is we want to yeah. raise as much money as possible uh, hence getting the, the wonderful experience of getting to have Michael Palin chat facts with us here. Um, mm-hmm. Comicrelief.com slash fish. If you could go there, we would love to raise a huge amount. We're going to have to wrap up now. Um, oh, no. Michael, I know I, 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 I hate that I'm thank wrapping you. this up. I hate that we're going to say goodbye to you, but thank you so oh. much for being here with us. This has been a dream of ours for a very long time to have oh. a podcast. So, um, yeah. Yeah. A pleasure, a pleasure thank to you do. Thank you so much. Lovely to talk with you all and such a good cause give 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 please to comic relief all right we'll see you all in a second we'll be back with our next guest sandy topspit we'll be back in about two minutes goodbye Hey, 
everybody. We hope you enjoyed watching that video from our 20 hour long No Such Thing as a Fish comic relief marathon. There are plenty more videos to watch, but before you watch them, we're going to ask you to donate to the cause that we did this for. Go to the link below and you will be sent to comicrelief.com slash fish where you can donate and help change lives. Donate now.